Sunday and into Monday and then into Tuesday and as a result of that slow motion what we expect is that there is going to be an unbelievable amount of rain over a very large area. Hopefully uh, the models will be correct. We're to weaken quickly here Alex. This storm is not slowing down. It's coming on and the worst of the hurricane is not that. Sometimes the toughest battle is just getting to the starting line. But for the last 12 years, sailors from all over the country have converged on the southern tip of Texas in the second week of June to travel north 200 miles to Magnolia Beach, braving the obstacles along the way. Many of the boats are home built like mine. Others are production boats, but it doesn't matter. Just get out there and do it. It's not a race and has been described as a rolling mess about. I stayed with Gordo and Mike. They were busy putting in a new reef point in Gordo's new-to-him boat. It was a good call. We can only help you if we all agree to keep our radios on 16 all day long. A lot of folks like to keep them off until they need it. But if we all did that, right, it doesn't work out. Please consider, do whatever you want. We only have three rules, right? But please consider, <laughs> please consider. So after Sunday morning's captain's meeting, I stocked up on groceries, checked the weather. After seeing the predicted winds, I decided to put an extra couple of reefs in my sail to start the sail out Monday morning. The trip in and back out of the harbor was a little harsher on my fuel consumption than I had anticipated. This came back to haunt me a little later in the day.
so I set out with my newly installed whisker pole and headed north. Thought I was going fast until I noticed four miles per hour. As predicted, the winds did pick up, and I was glad I had the two reefs in my sail, so I rolled up my jib and hung on. Winds topped out at 36 miles an hour and there was a small craft advisory in effect. Brent and Richard also hanging on. They were able to film when the conditions got a little worse and I chickened out and put my camera away. After about a 31 mile trip up this intercoastal way, I get to this intersection, which would take me to Camp One at the Port Mansfield Jetties. This is about a six mile run. The wind about this angle right here, and the waves rolling in from this direction. So I figured I'd fire up the motor so I could point a little better, keep the sails up, do some little motor sailing, and get down to the to the camp. If that didn't go well, we're to go back to state Port Mansfield. Another option would be go all the way down this way to the land cut. Last year's Camp 1. What I did, fired up the motor, I was making some ground, and I knew if I could get to these spoil islands, I'd be okay. About right here, the uh, motor ran out of gas. So the boat started drifting north, and I knew immediately that I needed to head back toward Port Mansfield. I wasn't sure where I was gonna stay in Port Mansfield. I didn't know what the accommodations were, the slip availability. I did my third option. The waters are much smoother now and I feel a lot better about the situation. Uh, I'm gonna keep on going to the land cut. I think I made the right decision. I just got word that uh, somebody's boat capsized way back there. A couple other boats were helping them and everything was under control. But Maximum speed, 9.7 knots. Pretty good for a 15 foot boat. The option to stay in the land cut was open to me because of the speeds I was traveling. I was able to travel 55 nautical miles and made it to the camp by 3.30. The only problem was, I was all alone. Well Turned out anchoring alone in a 36 mile an hour wind wasn't real easy either. Somehow I made it. I had learned something from last year. And I went to open this one. Try to make a little cooler in here. Right there. Ah! So I'm just gonna keep that closed. And I've got one magazine. My plan for the next day was to watch a parade of sailboats go by, which I didn't figure would get there until at least 12 o'clock. Then follow them to the next camp, which was Haps Cut, the notoriously mud hole of a camp. Since I'd traveled so far the day before, and with the wind blowing hard, it was going to be a short trip. Turns out my noontime calculations for the first boat to show up were a little off. These guys came by around 10 o'clock and had only stayed about two miles from where I had stayed with the same idea of taking refuge in the land cut. Turns out this was the boat that capsized. They made a great recovery. The story I heard is they lost a lot of gear after they righted the boat went to Port Mansfield, found a convenience store, and replenished their supplies. Texas 200 sailors are a resourceful bunch. It wasn't exactly the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, but I kind of liked it better. So after watching a few boats go by, it was time to pull up the anchor, make my way to Hap's Cut.
while at Hap's Cut, we had a little get-together to remember a couple of sailors that had participated in the Texas 200 that had passed away during the year. Much of the talk at the camp was about the upcoming forecasted weather. It wasn't looking good. Leaving Hap's Cut, I realized this might be my last full day of sailing in this year's 200. Report of a tropical depression, thunderstorms, rain, basic mayhem might put an end to this year's edition. The plan was to have a meeting at the Yacht Club at 7 o'clock that night and get the most up-to-date forecast to make decisions. Instead of using rumors and guessing, we'd be able to use state-of-the-art electronic devices that were out of range in the land cut. The location of the Padre Island Yacht Club in Corpus Christi, where I live, made it a very easy decision to be able to have my trailer brought over, pack up the boat, go on home and live another day. This is one of two boats that capsized on day one. This is Hello Kitty being towed in. Arrival time looks like 2.39 for the Padre Allen Yacht Club. You can see that checkered flag there. Hopefully we can uh, keep going. Don't know what the weather is going to be like, but we're going to have a meeting at 7 o'clock and kind of decide what we're going to do. At the Padre Island Yacht Club 7 o'clock meeting of the mines, the latest weather forecast had pushed all the predictions of bad weather back to Saturday just in time for the last day of the 200. Eating boiled shrimp in the rain sounded good to me. But it looks like some guys are stopping maybe to get some ice. They're sure not going to get any shrimp and fish this early in the morning. Coming up on Snoopy's Pier. There's the JFK Bridge, and uh, I was almost going to stop at that boat ramp over there, or, or here, due to the weather, but after taking a look at things last night, stick around and finish up. Headed out across uh, Corpus Christi Bay, it's pretty smooth today. It's like we've got some uh, really light conditions. If I can just find Stingray Hole, it's like everybody's uh, scattering out across the bay right now. Water's pretty deep until you get to Stingray Hole, and uh, there's a nice deep gap. But if you get north of it, it's a little, little shallow. Then go to the Port Aransas uh, Ferry Crossing, which is always interesting and see how it goes. All right, got some barge traffic coming straight down the ship channel. And we're trying to tack into a headwind. Then we have the uh, Port Aransas uh, Ferry coming up. Let this guy slip by, I think we'll be all right. And we can do a tack and we can get through here without any problem. And there's the ferry crossing. Made it. Looks like these guys behind me are going to make it too. That only took about 900 tacks. Originally, Camp 4 was planned to be at Paul's Mott, but in late April, a reconnaissance sail by some sailors determined that Hurricane Harvey had washed away a good portion of the beach and the camping space would be limited. 
So the organization decided to have a find your own camp night. Part of the day's trip included a long sail on the San Antonio Bay. The winds were blowing much more easterly in direction, which required the sails to be close hauled and on a beam reach. The waves were smashing into the starboard side, and although not bad at first, after a few hours it became a new form of water torture. I was glad to get across that bay, but I picked the right guys to follow. They beached their boats at Rattlesnake Island. The name sounds rough, but it was bees that were the nuisance until the sun went down. Another 50 plus mile day. This one just took longer. After a great night's sleep at Rattlesnake Island, it was nice to get back in the boat, get back after it, to Army Hole. It was good to get to Army Hole early while the water was still smooth and there was a good selection of parking places. Army Hole is one of the most popular camps, especially for those that sleep in tents during the trip with a nice grassy area. I sleep in the cabin on my boat. The docks at Army Hole have a tendency to block the breeze for good cabin ventilation, but this year I installed a bigger solar panel that allows me to run my GPS all day long and a fan all night. Goodbye, Army Hole. And there's Gordo and Mike right behind me following. Last down one leg to Magnolia Beach and get me some shrimp. Magnolia Beach right there at the checkered flag. Wing to wing. Got my whisker pole in. I'll make it two for four. You're batting 500 now. This is one of those cases where it's not a race, 
but I'm really trying to catch those guys. I got the pole out. That'll help. And it looks like I'm making some ground on them. I've got about an hour before. Magnolia Beach. Right here. Right there.